Welcome to the Game Changers podcast, where you'll hear from trailblazing women in sport. I'm Sue Anstis, a founding trustee of the Women's Sport Trust Charity and the founder and CEO of Promote PR, one of the UK's leading sports communications agencies. I am incredibly grateful to Barclays for supporting this series of the Game Changers, which will focus on fearless women in football reinforcing Barclays huge commitment to the beautiful game. Last year, Barclays announced the biggest ever sponsorship of women's sport in the UK as the Barclays FA Women's Super League became Europe's first fully professional women's football league. Along with this brilliant support for women's professional sport, Barclays also invested in establishing the Girls Football School Partnerships with the aim of ensuring that all girls in England have equal access to football in schools by 2024. My guest this week is Hope Powell, CBE, the trailblazing former England women's football manager and the first woman to be awarded a UEFA Pro Licence. Hope's had so many incredible achievements and awards an OBE, a CBE and honorary degrees from several universities, she was the second woman to be inducted into the English Football Hall of Fame following in the footsteps of the legendary Lily Parr. I was brought up on an estate and, um, you know, I just played it in the street, watched it on TV and then wanted to, to try and replicate what I saw on TV on the streets. I was a street kid, a street footballer, and my love came from that, just playing really, playing and watching it. And do you think you were aware at that stage that there were no women competing at that level? I, th- I think so. I think the fact that, the, you know, every everything you saw was always around men's football. It was always, it was nothing to do with, with you know, there were never any women uh, players shown on TV until I remember... Um, Channel 4 at the time showed, I think it was QPR, the first ever, I sound really old, I must be old, and that that was the only time I ever saw it exposed on TV, but generally it was all centred around men's football, to be honest. And as you mentioned, you were a, a kind of a strong playing as a young girl. And I think you and your, your school girlfriend, Jane, were, were banned from playing mixed football with, with the boys in the school, your school team because you were beating too many teams. So how did that feel to you at the time as a young girl? Well, well I couldn't really understand it at the time. It was, it was just a case of we just wanted to play and we were good enough to get into the school team. But unfortunately, the rules didn't allow it. But as, as a kid, you just you, you don't quite understand why not. The fact that you just want to play and you want to be part of the school team, it made no sense at the time. Um, so it was a little bit disappointing. You say it's kind of hard playing. Did you ever feel like giving up at that time when you had that no. kind of pressure? It made you feel stronger to keep playing? And I don't know. I, to be honest, I can't remember that far back, but it... it, it <laughs> crossed my mind to stop playing I just love I think you know I was quite sporty I quite liked and was very good at most sports so the, the one that I particularly enjoyed was football so it never ever yeah. stopped I still went back on the estate and played and continued to play until I was allowed to play organized football again and that was around I said 1978 you played with Millwall Lionesses I think you were just 11 or 12 so how did it feel then to be with so many Amazing female footballers for the first time, having having played on the street in the past. Yeah, I think I was a little bit shocked actually that um, you know it was organised. My first thought was, oh my god, there's so many girls that play. I thought it was brilliant, and you know they they were coached at the time, and there were cones, there were bibs, there were goals. It was proper proper football, so it was great. Great experience for me at that age. You mentioned playing on some pretty rubbish surfaces through that time. Do you think that kind of improved your skill level of the yeah, challenge? Probably did actually. Um, you know, I played on concrete, on muddy pitches, on I don't know every kind of surface you can think of. So <laughs> it probably gave me a really good grounded in, in terms of you know my technical ability. So it probably did me a favour in the long run. Probably not my body, but. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> skills. And you um, went on to get your first cap at just 16, which is pretty mm. extraordinary. How do you think your experience then was different to the young lionesses that are coming through today? It probably wouldn't happen today because there's obviously a clear pathway, which is great. I think it was quite daunting, actually, you know, being so young. But but thankfully, you, you know, I had at, at the time, Brenda also got called up. 
and you know some really good people that were there that, that looked after me but it was quite intimidating quite frightening I think um, until obviously you get on the pitch where you, you feel at ease and then then you, you know I was really able to show what I could do so very different times now because of the clear pathway and 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 rightly so, you know, there, there's an opportunity for, for players to grow and develop and um, have that education along the way and, and probably have a, a long lasting career if they're good enough. And the podcast is all about trailblazers and also recognising the incredible women behind the scenes making it happen. So can you tell us a little bit about women like Linda Whitehead and Sue Priors and the, the women that were behind the scenes then when you were growing up? Yeah, unsung heroes, really. I think they, they did a lot that other people probably wouldn't want to do, couldn't do. They kept the clubs afloat. Talking about Sue Pryor, she did so much off the pitch, you know, the organisation, the washing of the kit. She wrote weekly um, bulletins for the players. She did fundraising. She, you know, she did everything. As, as I guess the secretary of the club at that time, you know, without without much help, you know, one one person doing everything and, and quite phenomenal, actually. And it's it's really pleasing to know that she's still involved in the game at uh, Charlton. Yeah, and obviously with England, Linda Whitehead, again, you know, logistics, um, sponsorship, you, you know, making sure all the girls are all right. You know, and these were real, real good people that w- without those people, the game probably wouldn't be where it is today. So I think a lot of credit... Certainly for me, you know, Sue Pryor and Linda Whitehead in terms of administration and supporting the girls, backroom stuff that nobody sees, that those two are very um, prominent figures in the game, I would say. Excellent. That's good to hear. Good to hear. You were called into the FA's Lancaster Gate headquarters for a chat in uh, 1998. <laughs> and I think at the time you thought it might be something around youth team coaching, but that wasn't what they asked you. So um, how did you feel? You were just 21 I was 31. 31, sorry. Yeah. So how did uh, that feel at the time? Yeah, again, it was it, it was a surprise, all very surreal, all very, <laughs> you know, I think I think when they said about, you know, the England manager, I, I tried to really be cool as, as, I, <laughs> as, a, as I am, I guess, just my personality. And then obviously when, when I left, I was like, oh, my God, really? <laughs> but a real honour. But I wasn't, I wasn't absolutely sure I could, couldn't could understand it I couldn't make sense of it having had no experience in terms of management before I think I asked the right questions at the time um, I asked them you know I need some days to think about it and really it was it, it was the influence of, of my friends and I think what really stuck in my mind was what Kelly Simmons said at the time that really stuck in my mind. And then a really good friend of mine was like, well, it was Brenda, actually, you know, you, you've got to take it. Otherwise, there will be consequences. Um, <laughs> so yeah, you, you know, I, I, I went for it. And I, I think the fact that, um, you know, I had little, little experience of management, I just basically um, thought about what went before, what I liked, what I didn't like. I had a really good mentor at, at the time as well, still is my mentor today. And it just helped me get through it, to be honest. Did you have any idea, do you think, of the pressure and the criticism almost that that role would call in as well? No, because the game wasn't in the limelight as it is today. Mm. You know, there was no pressure. The expectation wasn't as great as it is today. So I I didn't even think about that, which was probably a good thing. It just allowed me to try and concentrate and do the best I could do at the time. Because you were still playing at the time. So did you consider the player-manager type role? Uh, no, it, it, it too much, too big a job, too much, and and obviously I had to detach myself from what were once teammates that then became yeah. become the manager of of your friends actually. So it, it yeah, I just had to to kind of separate the two. And I loved your comment that in one fell swoop, England got its first black manager, its first woman manager, and its first gay manager. So talk about being a, a game changer. Were you conscious of the that you were such a trailblazer at the time, or was it retrospectively you've looked back? Retrospectively, I think at the time you 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 know you're you're so consumed. I think at the time about just trying to do a good job. I think my my first thing was I cannot fail this. I cannot fail. You know, and that really drove me because. You know, what was the expectation? Somebody unknown, yes, known as a player, never known as a manager. It was, And I really thought at the time, and I asked the question, is it a token gesture? 
You know, I was really quite conscious of being a female, being black. You know, is this all a, a bit of a PR stunt, really? Um, so I was very conscious of working hard and not failing was not an option. You know, whatever success looked like at the time, clearly there were some targets, some things that I wanted to do, some things that I wanted to change, which I did. So the pressure of the job, it was never about, it was never results driven. It was never about media attention, which, which did me a favour at the time. It was an enormous brief, really, with no template to follow. It must have been very daunting in those early days. Did you find it was especially hard as a woman in that role at the FA at the time? Um, th- there wasn't the resources and the, the support there is, is today, obviously. Although I must say that as I grew into the role, that Howard Wilkinson, Robin Russell... You know, they really all supported me because I kept asking questions. I kept going back and what about this? What about this? What about this? And, um, you know, Howard in particular really embraced it in the end. I'm not sure, you, you know, at the beginning, he, he, he did say to me, look, I really don't, I don't follow the women's game. I'm not familiar with it, but I'm, I'm here to help. And he was probably my biggest ally. He was fantastic, to be fair. So, you, you know, it, it, it was difficult because it was all about the men's game. It was, you know, as it is today, but not so much so. But I, I think it allowed me to quietly behind the scenes make changes in my own way. Which was and cool. you've said, if you like to be liked, probably football management's not for you. Was that one of the hardest parts of the role, do you think? What, not being liked? Or... Yeah, or, or, or showing yourself up against the attack or the pressure and so on from people from, from the outside. I think, you know, it's very easy watching the game and, um, you know, making all these should have done this. Should I mean, it happens today and the men should have done this. And should, People really, and I'm very, very sympathetic to all the managers that get criticised by people that really do not understand what goes on behind the scenes. Sat on the sofas at home. Yeah, which is, you know, the beauty of the game, I guess. But decisions, are met, you know, aren't made randomly. They're made based on the knowledge you have at the time and you, you make certain decisions because of, other, because of other things happening going on. It's a tough role and you, you have to really be, you, you know, hardened to it. If you, if you want to be liked and popular and, you, you know, and we've seen some great managers in men's football, haven't we, gone from hero to zero in a very, very mm. quick space of time. So... You know, you have to be be prepared for that in management, that, that you're not always going to be popular. The pathway for female players, as you mentioned earlier, that whole from all the youth teams and so on, really transformed under your watch. And before you started, there weren't really any, any youth squads. You just got sort of thrown in at the deep end with senior players. How easy was it to make those, those changes? It helped because of, of competition. So UEFA um, and FIFA started to promote the, the, the youth competitions, which, which gave me the ammunition to go, I guess, to the board and go, look, this is happening. We need to get a team together. We need to, to obviously have trials. We need to do all these things to make ensure that we are prepared. So when, when you wait for Dudu and under, I think the first one was, so they did an under-19 competition in my first year there was a, a a group of players but we had to build on that then they introduced the under 17s um I wanted to I introduced an under 15 to feed the under 17s at the time I then introduced an under 21 to feed the seniors so that there was a clear a clear pathway and back then we had um two-year age bands now because the talent pool is a lot broader they're going for single year age bands which, which makes sense so, yeah, it, it, it was good to have that in place to, you know, promote the best talent that we had and give them a chance, really. You were the first woman in the country, I believe, to achieve your pro licence qualification. Um, and there was speculation at the time that you might be the first woman to coach a men's professional team. Do you get close at the time? Um, I, I was offered, a, I won't say who, I was offered a, a lower league uh, job in the men's game, which... I refused. You know, I, I did think about it, but I refused. I think the assumption, the assumption was that you know, working in the men's game is better than working no. for England. I just couldn't really. What you know, and that's a really poor assumption, actually. 
my, my passion is the women's game. I would obviously never say no. It's about opportunities. And I've always said it, if a, if an opportunity presented itself that I felt passionately about, then like any other career choices, then I'd, I'd look at it. But my passion really is the women's game. And, you know, I'm thankful that, you know, I stayed in it and I'm still lucky enough to be in it. You're very much the driving force behind the Women's Super League. How proud are you to see how that's evolved over the past decade? It wasn't just me, to be honest. There were a lot of people that were involved in that. I played a very, very small part. Um, Yeah, I I thought at at the time it was, um, you know, we wanted to try and create a league that would be better than any other. We really wanted the league. This is the only bit I would say is a bit disappointing, but understand, uh, understandable. So we wanted to create a league where English players would be at the forefront of it and be the best they can be within the league and actually play rather than going abroad and playing like we had a few players that went off to the States. I mean, mm. so you wanted to make it create a league which would attract, you know, homegrown English talent. As it stands, it's, it's become so good that everybody from abroad wants to come and play in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, I think it, it, it's attracted the best talent. So that's a compliment to the league, which is a detriment sometimes to English talent sitting on the bench, a bit unfortunate. You know, I think what, what they've done in, in sort of recent years, broadcast deals, um, live games, weekly live games has, has, has been really tremendous. I think certainly the, the World Cup boosted that in terms of attention around the game. So the, the, the Super League, it's great. I think, you know, the challenge is to make it as competitive as it can be rather than, you know, almost being a split league, you know, three, league, three leagues within a league. That, that's the danger. That's the bit. And, and being involved in it now from a club perspective, you, you, you just see the divide, which is a little bit, you know, I'm looking thinking, right, OK, we have to be careful here. You know, it's starting to end up like the men's game where you've got the top, the ones that have got the most money, get the best players. And if you've got the best players, you've got the best chance of winning everything while everybody else struggles around. And, you know, it's a bit, it, it, it's challenging. I think there's some challenges coming that that, that need to be managed. Yeah. Excellent. That's good. Uh, good to hear. And I, and I guess it is that whole wanting to take on the positive parts of the men's game without some of the negative side too, but... With more finding coming through too. Um, looking back at your your role, I guess your amazing role as England manager for so long, and you commented that you knew in 2011, 2013 that things weren't going so well in some of the, the tournaments there. Did you alert people at the time? Did you think people perhaps didn't didn't listen to you there? Um, no, I thought at 2011, I thought we did well. I think 13 was uh, probably, you know, I could. I, Almost in the tournament, I, mean, I knew it was going to be a bad tournament. I knew it was, and you, you, you have this feeling in this sense. And, you know, I was kind of making plans for the next stage, you know, that the kids coming through were probably at the point where they would then all be introduced. You know, the kids that are playing now were, were going to be at the forefront of my next sort of campaign. But sadly, I didn't get the chance to do that. But, but you have a feeling as, as a manager and a, a coach, you, you know, sometimes it becomes all too familiar for players. And I, I would have changed it, absolutely changed it. But, you, you, you know, it was my decision and it is what it is. So, you know, it's great to see those younger players now come through and are kind of doing really well. Yeah, so. absolutely. And sadly, August 2013, you, you lost your role there at the FA and obviously a lot of press and profile around that too how did you deal with that loss at the time on a, on a personal level yeah I, I was an I mean it, I, I, you know I, I quote I, I can't talk too much about the ins and outs of it because of well, obviously gagging clauses and all of that um I, I you know openly will say I'll be forever disappointed I think I was treated quite badly but I guess every manager would say that it's not nice to lose your job I think that the biggest thing for me, it was it was everybody else around me who really took it badly, which probably helped me, actually, because I ended up having to look after everybody else. I must give credit to the LMA, who were absolutely fantastic and really supported me through it. But to, to be honest, it was not pleasant, but it, it really just made me look forward. That's past. I'm just going to look forward. And I think my mindset and how I very quickly 
decided that this would not define me really helped me. And the fact that I had to end up looking after everybody else really helped me as well. So it was strange times, but, you know, I got through it as, as everybody would get through it. Not nice because it's quite public. But in all honesty, I think I did a great job. I loved every minute apart from the last five minutes, you know, and, and I'm very thankful that I got the opportunity to manage my country. I love that. It must have been pretty exhausting in your role. So you're 15 years, back-to-back tournaments, managing five teams, building the academy, helping to form that Super League. You're constantly in the spotlight, almost the face of the women's game as the profile grew and, and also fighting those internal battles for funding and support. Do you look back now and think you're almost doing a job of, of three or four people, especially where they are now? You know, when I, when I came away, I really, I was like, I don't know how I did that. I do know because I was so driven and so obsessed to to help shift it on, you know, really passionate and, and wanted some equality to a degree. I, I, and I think I, I, where I started is where I ended by, you know, I don't want to foul. I don't want to foul myself and I don't want to foul the women's game. And that, and that gave me a real drive. But absolutely, I, I, I did a lot of work, you know, which, which today there are more people that are doing the work, which is, which is great. I just, you know, it would have been great to have it back then. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> That's one of the things where I say I'll be forever disappointed because I was treated badly. I don't, you know, I did a lot. I did a lot. And I think people do recognise that. I mean, certainly on the podcasts and a lot of the players, like yeah. Kelly and Casey and whatever, talk a lot about you and the impact you've had on their past and then on, obviously on what they're they're doing now too. So it's, it's great to hear that too. Do you think at the time, if there had been other senior roles in women's football in the UK, some of these senior manager roles, you might have left of your own accord sooner if there had been in the way that there is now with WSL? Probably. You, you know, it, 2009, when we got to the final, I kind of really wanted to, to stop then. But the roles weren't, you know, it's so different now. It's so different but that that was the time when I thought, really, I need to to stop. But obviously, you still have to pay a mortgage and you still have to do those things that kind of sway you. 2011, I loved that tournament, the World Cup. So, yeah, I was tired. I was tired in the end. But looking back now, or watching the Lionesses play last summer, etc., do you have some sympathy for Press's attitude to Phil Neville and the way he's now treated as England manager? I was asked this question um, a couple of weeks ago when oh, yeah. we weren't on lockdown. You, you know, what do you think about you know the She Believe Cup? And, and you, you know, it's really difficult. It, it, it's unfair because they are friendly tournaments. The friendly tournaments that I was involved in allowed the players like Lucy Bronze, Jordan Nobbs, Steph Houghton, and all of those players to get experience. You know that that present them as they are today so let's let's not focus on the friendly tournaments focus on the tournaments that matter i.e the world cup that's just gone i mean focus on the next tournament i just and that's the downside of, of football you know the press i think got to put it in context it's a friendly tournament they're friendly matches make the judgment when it, it matters in my opinion and you went on you mentioned almost leaving that role and then and then looking forward and doing some amazing stuff and you did some work with FIFA and UEFA on a global basis can you tell us a little bit about what what you did there so a lot of coach education um a lot of speaking at conferences so just just sharing a bit of my knowledge um and imparting it with with other coaches was brilliant I loved it Travelled for two years around the globe, all over, just sharing my knowledge and, and helping coaches develop was was fantastic, fantastic opportunity. And I'm really thankful for, you know, FIFA and UEFA that, that give not, not just me, lots of other female coaches that can't perhaps get in the game full time, the opportunity to to go and influence and help other coaches in developing countries, in, in developed countries. It, it was brilliant. I really enjoyed it, really loved it. So, yeah, I had a good time doing it. And it really gave me a chance to reflect, take time out, um, meet loads of different people. Yeah, it was good times. Good time. Excellent. And then back to Brighton Hove album. It's been your second year now? 
third. Third year, into your third year. So people, I guess, surprised that you took a role at the time, perhaps in WSL2 rather than a... Yeah, well, I, I mean, you, you know, before I went to the PFA, as you probably know, and so the whole coach education, and then I really just thought, you know, I wanted to get back on the grass. I, I started to put the feelers out. I thought, right, I, you know, I think I'm ready to come back on the grass, be part of a game, be part of a team. Brighton, because of, of the chief exec, who I know very well for the time at the FA, I knew they had ambitions to be in WSL1, met the club, good club, players that, that wanted to do well, the club that wanted to do well, good choice, a good fit, good match for me. So I was more than happy. And it, I'm a bit of a builder. I like to build stuff rather than the other way around. So, yeah, it was perfect. It was ideal. And WSL too, I just thought, what a, what a great experience. Yeah. So, yeah. And you're enjoying your time there, you're building, as you said. Fantastic club, fantastic people. I'm very... I feel very honoured and lucky to be at a club that that value the women's game and value people. So very happy. And a beautiful part of the world as well. Yes. (laughs) And then I come back, but yeah. (laughs) Excellent. And just finally, so obviously you've achieved so much in your career and had a massive impact on the women's game. What's what's next in your career? Clearly you're well established at Brighton, but there are other ambitions that you have within the game. Yes, I would like to win the league, win the Champions League. Yeah, all those things. I want the club to grow, develop. I'd, I'd like to, I, I think my, my sort of next ambitions, hopefully within Brighton, is, you know, I'd like to be the, come off the grass at some point and be the sort of technical director, something along that, that you know, that guys. Be, be, still be involved in the game. Love to stay at Brighton. I keep saying, saying, don't, don't fire me just yet. Want to stay, <laughs> but it's such a good club. I'm, I feel very lucky and very honoured to be there. So, so to stay within the club, don't necessarily want to stay on the grass forever. The thing is, when you're away from the grass, then you miss it. Then you yeah. want to go. Back. Yeah, but yeah, still to be involved in it. And I think the thing is, I love. You, you know, I've got a very, very good team, and I want to help them as people develop. Um, I'm very passionate about developing others and helping others be the best they can be. So, yeah, yeah. Thanks so much to Hope for taking the time from her very busy schedule to talk with me. Thanks also to Barclays for their support for the Game Changers podcast, which enables us to take the stories of these amazing, fearless women in football to a huge new audience. If you've enjoyed this podcast, then please make sure you don't miss out on future episodes by subscribing to The Game Changers. It would also be fantastic if you could give us a rating or a review wherever you get your podcast. It really does make a big difference. Thanks to Sam Walker from What Goes On Media, who's been a brilliant executive producer for this series of The Game Changers podcast. If you want to find out more about all my guests, you can at promotepr.com slash gamechangers and you can find me across social media at Sue Anstis or The Game Changers on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. The Game Changers. Fearless women in football.